So today I'm going to be exploring the world with you, um, many different parts of all the sacred sites that are stretched out all over the planet. Now, we know that Glastonbury is a very powerful sacred centre, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other sacred centres all around the world. And we're going to take a deep look at some of these and see the connections and see how they join up using many different... Um, many different things that you'll be quite surprised with. This is the book I published a couple of years ago. Uh, we're going to be covering some of the aspects uh, from this book and uh, some of the things we're going to get into today are here, including we're going to come always, we're going to come back to Giza because that seems to be the centre of the whole Earth grid system. We're going to be looking firstly at some other planets and all the connections on there as well. We're going to be looking at ley lines, uh, great circles and dragon paths all around the planet, not just in local areas. And the crystal core, which is something that some Russian researchers came up with uh, back in the early 70s, as well as the work of Ivan Sanderson, who came up with his vial vortices theory. Sacred geometry and the platonic solids obviously come into this, as do the ancient maps and surveying of the planet. And we'll find as well that the sites all around the world are very similar, not just in design, but in their energy and their magnetism and their electromagnetic charge. First of all, I want to just uh, really put this out there for John Michel, who's a big inspiration for me. He's spoken at this conference. He was behind the founding of Megalithomania back in 2005, 2006. And it's really his work that set the stage for this global kind of idea of what, the way all these sites join up around the planet. Is there any, can we have this? Thing on this fan on here, anyone, or is this going to be too noisy? Um, okay, okay, I'll just sweat away then. Um, uh, so th these are these are some of the words of John Michel. This, this is a paraphrase from the View Over Atlantis, uh, and I'll read it out to you because I think this is very relevant to what we're looking at today, and I, I'm sure you'll resonate with it as well. A great scientific instrument lies sprawled over the entire surface of the globe. At some period, perhaps it was over 4,000 years ago, almost every corner of the world was visited by a group of people who came with a particular task to accomplish. With the help of some remarkable power by which they could cut and raise enormous blocks of stone, they erected vast astronomical instruments, circles of erect pillars, pyramids, underground tunnels, cyclopean alignments, whose course from horizon to horizon was marked by stones, mounds and earthworks. The vast scale of prehistoric engineering is not yet generally recognised, and this is still the case, even though this was written way back in 1969. There's even some old myths and legends that refer to the Earth grid. This is a famous Hopi creation myth talking about Grandmother Spider Woman and the way she created the Earth with a crystal at this core and the energy she put forward into this crystal core bounced back and she created these two brothers who were like represented different aspects, one with sound and one with form. And then when this bounced back off the crystal, it created these what she called spots of the fawn. And you may have heard this in some Hopi traditions. And these spots are what we now refer to as ancient sacred power spots around the world. And we'll see examples of this, not just in North America, as where the Hopi come from, obviously, but all around the world. But first, I'd like to jump off world. I think we'll go to Mars first. Because one of the things that intrigued me and kind of I wanted, to, I wanted more evidence that it was actually some kind of Earth grid or planetary kind of matrix. So I started looking at other planets and I did a bit of research with John Martineau for my book uh, before it was published. And this is uh, Mars and it's got a connection with Hawaii, interestingly, because the most powerful, largest volcano complex in the solar system is actually the Olympus Mons complex on Mars. And that sits at 19.47 or, or rounded off to 19.5 degrees above the equator. And um, the same as Hawaii does in, on Earth. And this whole area is connected with the whole Cydonia region where they believe they found pyramids in the Great Face on Mars. But it's not just really on Mars. We can see that the sun has increased solar flare activity at 19.5 degrees. And, um, and we, we find certain aspects on other planets where strange cloud bands and sort of unusual energy effects appear at that particular latitude above and below the equator. So this is obviously what is represented when you place a tetrahedron or two tetrahedrons inside the sphere. Where they touch the surface is 19.47 degrees. So immediately we must question, 
Is this geometry existent within the sun, within Mars, and possibly within the Earth and other planets? And these are just energy effects from these internal geometries, which I certainly believe they are. This is just some interesting, um, it's interesting geometries that I've spotted on the surface of certain moons and planets. This is Miranda, which is Uranus's moon. And you can see hexagonal and pentagonal geometries connecting up, as well as triangular uh, here, uh, features here, which is very unusual, uh, and they really kind of shouldn't be there. Uh, again, on the top of um, Saturn, the North Pole, there's this huge energy sort of signature, which is a huge hexagon, twice the width of the Earth. Uh, this is what we're dealing with it, and it stays kind of stationary as the planet's cloud bands move around it, as though it has some kind of cymatic effect, like some energy is kind of holding it there. Now, this is very unusual. This, this really shouldn't be there, and I'm sure any, uh, anyone who's into this kind of subject would agree. This just shows you uh, a more recent uh, NASA photograph, and this just shows you again that hexagonal shape. Also, on Iapetus, which is one of Saturn's moons, this is a great ridge that goes all the way around the center, like, a, like the equator of the whole planet. And this is very unusual. This really shouldn't be there. It's like a 12-mile high wall um, that's about 12 miles wide as well, and it just goes exactly around the center of the moon. Now, was that almost like a tennis ball has been sliced in half and roughly glued together. Um, so maybe it was the gods at work uh, way back when. So we come back to Earth, uh, we've had our interplanetary excursion. Uh, this is where we start applying these same principles to the Earth. This is what some people believe is a dodecahedron represented on Earth, and it's actually the mid-Atlantic ridge. And uh, when placed, uh, when the top and bottom parts are placed at the north and south pole, and you rotate it into the correct position, it kind of almost exactly follows the mid-Atlantic ridge as though it was it was like there's like a dodecahedral matrix of energy within the planet. And even Plato, um, going back, you know, thousands of years ago, said the Earth, when viewed from above, resembles a ball sewn from 12 pieces of skin. And this is a dodecahedron with 12 different faces upon the sphere. If we look at the, some of the early work of Ivan Sanderson, he wrote some classic paranormal books. He was also a biologist and researcher back in the early 70s. And one of his research projects was looking at strange anomalies around different parts of the world. And he noticed when he did lots of tests uh, using the, the technology at the time and all the data he collected from different countries, he noticed there were 12 particular areas around the world where strange effects happened on the surface. Disappearances, time dilations, gravitational anomalies, magnetic anomalies, disappearances completely of planes and ships. Often they would come back years later. Very strange things were going on. And he called them the vile vortices. And he published this uh, back in 1972, I think, um, in, in an article called The Twelve Devil's Graveyards Around the World. And immediately, you know, when you look at this, you, you'll notice that these points, these 10 points going around the Tropic of Cancer, and uh, well, both this area here and here, and the Capricorn, and the North and South Pole make the 11 and 12 points look exactly like the points of an icosahedron, which is a 20-sided polygon made up of triangular faces. So again, we're seeing a planetary grid at work using the icosahedron. This area here is obviously the Bermuda Triangle, and this is this area here. And each Easter Island has many strange anomalies associated with it. The whole uh, the volcano on the island, it was said that the Moai, or the, or the, the great big Easter Island statues, were actually, wrote, it were actually levitated that into place. But always, they were levitated around this huge magnetic zone, which is the mountainous uh, the volcano there. And the same on Hawaii, there's very strange, there's a huge volcano area up there, as we always, already said, at 19.47 degrees. And around the world, there's lots of other data picking up this kind of um, suggestion. And also the Devil's, uh, great, uh, the Devil's Triangle off the coast of Japan as well. So immediately, We've seen you know, a couple of interesting um, different 3D geometries that seem to energetically occur within the planet. This just shows you, the black lines show you the icosahedron. The red line, is the pri I believe, is the ancient prime meridian that used to go through Giza. And the white line, we'll come on to later, but this is a very specific great earth circle or global ley line that goes all the way around the planet, which was discovered about 15 years ago by Jim Allenson. So at the same time Ivan Sanderson was doing his research on the 12 Devil's Graveyards around the world, 
some Russian researchers, I won't even attempt to pronounce their names, but they're written down here. Um, they came up with a similar theory where they actually believe, and this was published in you know, several scientific journals back in the early 70s, that initially the Earth was a great crystal, a geometric crystal, and as it spanned over millions of years, Earth was formed onto it, and that created the Earth as we know it. But the energy of that crystal is still present within the, on the surface of the Earth and can be detected. And this is what they came up with. This is their original drawing. So these are the five, five platonic solids that combine. Uh, but they were really focused on the dodecahedron and, and the icosahedron, just coincidentally at the same time as Ivan Sanderson made his icosahedral discovery. Um, and uh, they overlaid them both, and suddenly they found all these matching things. They found sacred sites would fit onto it. They found migratory paths of animals, uh, and many different anomalies um, all around the world that seemed to match this. There's many, many different examples. Some of it was speculative, some of it was actual, uh, but I cover all this in uh, my book about Earth grids. This just shows you another version of their grid. It looks like a net, really, around the world. Uh, but this just shows you a combination of the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, or icosadodecahedron combined. Um, and again, we start to see patterns emerging. Uh, there's little areas like here we'll have a look at more closely in detail. Also, it fits um, with uh, Ivan Sanderson's. We have the Bermuda Triangle there. Uh, we even have a point up in northern Scotland here. And there's an area in Australia here we'll have a closer look at as well, where it's almost like the landmass forms around these energetic grid points, which it really shouldn't, but it does. So this just shows you the icosadodecahedron combined. The uh, yellow or green line is the dodecahedron, the black is the icosahedral matrix, and this is the great Earth circle we'll have a look at shortly. But uh, not long after that, Bruce Cathy was, um, he was a pilot. He, he died recently, unfortunately. He was a sort of legendary figure in the, in the study of earth grids. But he really was one of the most important people when it comes to sort of decoding what was going on, on the planet in ancient times. And he, when he was a pilot, he used to witness many different flight paths, uh, sort of UFOs, and he started mapping their flight paths around the world. And this is the kind of map he came up with over New Zealand when he plotted all these onto um, a map of that particular country. And he noticed they always seemed to fly in straight lines. And they used to go, they used to cross and just go north, south, east, west, and that was about it. And he found that very strange as though there was some kind of grid they were following. You can see that here. This is kind of the map he came up with with some of the major um, you know, sightings marked on the map. He later had a revelation where he found, he found a picture of this that was photographed under the sea actually off the coast of uh, Cape Horn in South America. And he, and he sort of realised that must be some kind of alien antenna, although some people say it looks like a, a deep sea sponge, unfortunately. But when he combined that with his research in New Zealand, he came up with this grid map here, which he realised was a combination of the cube and the octahedron. So it was the other two platonic solids. Suddenly all five now were discovered by different people at different times around the world. You can see that here. Uh, this just shows you uh, the octahedron. The yellow is the octahedron. We still have the dodeca and the icosahedron and the prime meridian, which we'll come on to shortly. This was later developed by William uh, Becker and Beth Hagens, who uh, did this brilliant uh, bit of research. They were actually um, study. They were actually teachers at university in New England, and they got all their they got all their students working on this particular map and they designed it according to what had been discovered before them, but then dis applied the work of Buckminster Fuller and, uh, and his Dymaxion maps and his geodetic uh, domes designs to make it more structurally strong. And they came up with this, which is basically the same, but it's much more stable and it makes sense for the particular shape of the Earth, which is slightly um, squashed. And here, suddenly, we see clearly this, this grid point here clearly shows the entire landmass forming around this grid point. And we see the same thing here in South America. We see we've got the Bermuda Triangle area there. Uh, we've got Timbuktu kind of area here, and just north, the whole Giza and the, the whole Delta region there, and many other points. And each of these kind of points does have something significant, which is uh, obviously deep, I can't really go into right now. This just shows you the um, 
the uh, European version of their original analysis they did uh, back in the 1980s. And they kind of decided to kind of experiment and join all these lines together. They, they knew some of them may be ley lines or, or astronomical alignments. Um, but you can see some significant ones here. This one in particular is interesting because it's very reminiscent of the St. Michael axis that was originally discovered by John Michel and then worked with by Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst. Uh, and also this line here, it's very close to the Apollo-Athena axis, which was uh, discovered by Jean Riker, worked with by Christine Rohn and John Michel at a later date. This is actually what you can do yourself. You can actually get Google Earth and you can get Beth, Beth Hagen's grid map and actually overlay it. And, and you can just have certain geometries on, turn all the other ones off, and you can actually start playing with it. And you can zoom in, and you can see where sites line up. So it's open for all now. This is a free application. You apply to Google Earth, and I highly recommend it. Uh, a lot of discoveries have been made just using this. I also, I've also been working with a, a program designed by John Martineau, his World Grid program, which is much more specific and goes into many different geometries. Um, and so we've found quite a few discoveries in that which have been uh, published in the book. But again, this is a much more accurate version of the Earth. And Google Earth is surprisingly accurate when you go zooming in and want GPS locations of, of specific sites. I do, highly, I do recommend it if you want to go into detail. And just if you want to have real fun, go to megalithic.co.uk and download their app, which has got 18,000 sacred sites, which you can overlay on the, on the Google Earth as well. So these two combined create this remarkable system of research. And uh, I highly recommend it. Let me know what you find out. So this just shows you the latest kind of version of how they think the grid moves around in Britain. Uh, this isn't accurate. It's not exactly the Michael line, but it's not too far. It's only a couple of degrees off. This, uh, you can, there's many other lines you could add to this. The Bellinus line, which is what Gary Bilcliffe's been working on, fits with the Rose line as well. It could, almost fits in with this. Kalanish is up here. Some people suggest this point here should actually be in Kalanish because Kalanish is like a cross shape like that in the landscape. But you can see the way it kind of neatly shapes uh, the whole landscape of the British Isles. This just shows you um, the North American grid. This is one of the early maps they did, uh, one of the ones they got their students to work on. Uh, again, we have the Bermuda Triangle here. And down here is very interesting. This is one of the oldest cultures in North America, the Hohokam. And they go back about 10,000 years. And they built all these huge um, canals and tunnels. And they had a very um, specific culture going way back, way back into the prehistory. And they were all focused around this area here. And uh, so you can see that there's things going on. You need to sort of get the maps out and do your homework to find out the intricate details. Or buy my book. Um, this is one of the faces of what is called, basically the map we saw before, the large world map that Becker and Hagen's pulled together, when popped out into 3D, it looks like this. Now this isn't really a recognisable form, but it's basically a combination of the Icos of Dodecahedron with, with parts of the other platonic solids uh, melded in. It's actually called a rhombic triacontahedron. So I'm going to test you at the end, so you better remember that. So rhombic triacontahedron, just to sort of um, blow your minds with big words. And this is one of the faces of it, the way it goes across the Americas, all centered around this area, around the Bermuda Triangle. And we're actually going to the Bermuda Triangle in January, just to go on a cruise around there on this, um, this sort of le lecture cruise we're doing with David Childress and Robert Schock. Um, so we're going to see, hopefully we won't disappear, and we'll be back. I'll keep you informed. So anyway, so we've sort of seen like the idea of the grid. We're gonna, we, this is a general overview. We don't really have, have a huge amount of time to kind of explore it in great detail, but hopefully that'll inspire you to either, you know, get my book, explore it a bit further. Now you can actually use Google Earth and actually apply these yourself. You can really play and you can really see what geometries fit over which sites, which one goes past your house which one goes over your friend's house. So you can actually kind of, and you can see, then certain geometries are different frequencies. So there might be some kind of practical kind of healing thing you can work with in the landscape. The list goes on. But now I want to get into some more geodesy or geodesy, which is uh, really the study of the relationship of ancient sites around the world. 
Um, this obviously fits in with the grid idea and it suggests and kind of proves potentially that the ancients may well have been working with these grids because it seems a bit far-fetched. How could they travel all around the world? How could they have all these, this knowledge in different areas, in different places? It doesn't make sense because in traditional history, um, there was no communication across the oceans, but in real history there was. Uh, when we look at you know the science, you know diffusionism, and we look at the evidence of all the boats and ships that have been discovered, even the ones around the Giza Plateau, which are like 2000 BC or, or older. Uh, in England, there was quite a vast amount of uh, sailing that was carried out from from this country, going back thousands of years. Uh, there's boats being found in Peru, in Mexico, many other places. So we know uh, it was a navigational kind of system that they were working with. Now, this really this really interests me. Uh, this one, this is, it might look just like a lion on a globe, which it is, I guess. Um, but this here is Newgrange. This here is the the Great Pyramid which is actually this one here at Giza. And this is exactly, the distance here is exactly, if you continue this all the way around the world into a great hoop or great circle, it's exactly one-tenth of the planetary circumference. Like, exactly one-tenth. We've, we've measured it, we've tested it, we've used different techniques to kind of get this result. It's one-tenth. And that alone is like, oh, that, is that just a pure coincidence? Or is there something else going on here? Um, so Ireland, obviously, is a fascinating place. There's some of the most ancient, mystical, megalithic sites there uh, I've ever seen in my life. And we're actually going back there in August on a bit of a research trip. We're going over there with Glenn and Cameron Broughton on a tour research trip. And obviously, Egypt, what can be said about that? We're going to get more into Egypt. Um, it's just a little, uh, this is the thing we're doing in August. Um, anyone would like to join us, please grab a flyer or have a chat with us because we're going to be exploring new grains in that whole area very intensely, see what we can find out there. There's some other alignments I want to point out. This was originally discovered, this one, by Carl Monk and later by Court Lindahl, who, uh, um, who I'm using some of his graphics here. The, this area here is in North America. This is the whole Ohio region. And this is a, a site called Newark Earthworks. And this is it now. And this is a huge site. This is just one small part of it. I'll show you the, the whole site in a moment. Uh, but this particular orientation here, or this azimuth, is very interesting. Because obviously, that is the direction it's built in. You know, you, you can't deny that. But if you actually continue that line, and just, just keep, keep going all the way, uh, it just goes straight into the Great Pyramid at Giza almost exactly to the center. Look how close that is. You can't get, really get any closer. And so is that a coincidence? Or was it, was it aligned to Giza? Was Giza known about by all these different cultures in ancient times? And they were always referring back to that when they constructed and designed these sites. Now, the difficulty in knowing where Giza is when you're that far away is quite something. Um, here's, just, um, here's just a couple of shots of the earthwork itself. It's actually annoyingly and confusingly for future archaeologists, they've turned it into a golf course. Um, and so the original shape's still there, but within the main structure we just saw, uh, structure we just saw is actually a large golf course. Here just shows you the height of some of them, are over you know, seven, seven feet, eight feet high. Um, here shows you some of the geometries encoded within it. And this is uh, something that Ross Hamilton, a good friend of ours, researcher, has been doing. He lives in, he's lived in the Ohio Valley for all his life. And he's been noticing some of the intricate and really fascinating secret hidden geometries within these sites over in Ohio. There's hundreds of thousands of mounds and earthworks all through uh, North America, especially in the central region around the Mississippi and in the whole Ohio Valley. And just to show you the size of this, these triangles are the faces of the Great Pyramid. That's how big this is. Uh, and also, weirdly, the faces of the Great Pyramid are part of the geometric makeup of this site. Now, is that a coincidence? Again, th these coincidences keep popping up and we have to kind of question if they are coincidences or if an ancient geodetic system was known worldwide and they were always referring back to Giza as the centre point of the world grid. And just to, you know, just to give you a bit more information about it, these, all the alignments, all these different angles, as well as pointing directly to Giza, are all, are accurately map out the different solar and lunar alignments throughout the years, over an 18.6 year period uh, of the different extremes of the moon um, and obviously the, the solar year of the sun. 
Um, so that alone is quite remarkable, but the fact it also aligns precisely with Giza is even more so. But look at, we saw how big this was. We can see that a whole, about this, that sized area will fit a face of the Great Pyramid. Well, this here is only a smaller version of this. This is the bit we were just looking at. So we're looking at about four to six square miles of earthworks um, stretching across the end. This is just one of the sites in, in the Ohio area, which is one of them. Uh, there's even an avenue that goes from here all the way down to Chillicothe, or Chillicothe, oh, I can never say it, Chillicothe, um, which is about 18 miles long. And it's two linear earthworks, perfectly straight, all the way down to this other ancient uh, earthwork site around that particular city. So we can see here, it's just, this is just a sort of more local example of what we're dealing with here. And these earthworks are beautiful. They're, a lot of them have been preserved. A lot of them were mapped out by Squire and Davis uh, when they went there, uh, before all the settlers came in and destroyed them. Um, but this is the kind of thing, you know, an example of what we're dealing with in North America. And not many people realize they're even there. So I like to put these in my talks. Now, this is a, we went here as well. Uh, me, me and Sheena visited this whole, we spent six weeks, five or six weeks exploring the whole area and doing some research. This is a much deeper cut earthwork. This is more like the henge we see at Avebury. But this is bigger than the Avebury henge, the, the cut, you know, the, the bank and the ditch, Avebury, for instance. Much bigger, much deeper. This is a huge amount of man hours and work put into this. Um, so we just have to sort of question um, who these people were, why they were doing it, and how they did it. Uh, because this is just the tip of the iceberg when we start looking at these connections. Um, I think I've put this in twice for some reason, but this just shows you it again with the golf course. This is why I get, like, why do they put golf courses in ancient earthwork sites? It just becomes, even at Royston near Cambridge, where, where I'm from, there's some mounds and there's even one of the only long barrows in East Anglia around this whole Royston area, which actually the Michael line goes through. And they built a golf course on it. So as soon as the golf course gets disused, a thousand years time, these archeologists are gonna look at it and not know what's going on. Um, so it's a little bit frustrating, but kind of humorous at the same time. Um, so this again, this just shows you what we just were just talking about and the way it bisects um, these two very important ancient sites together. So back to Giza. Now, it's been known and discussed by a lot of people over the years that it's, when you start looking at the relationship of ancient sites around the world, you can't help but notice that when you look at the distances between them, they all relate to Giza Plateau, to the alignment going through the Great Pyramid, as though that was zero degrees uh, longitude. Um, and so this is where it should be. Actually, it's here, which is probably pretty much 30 degrees off. That's where it is now, but that was more of a political naval decision than it was for, um, than it was for anything useful. Um, but if you look at this, the, the most land mass in all directions goes from this area here. It's almost like it's the gravitational land center point of the planet. And that could have been why it was chosen, because it's got more land mass in all directions than any other place on the planet. So, um, and this is like the, the latitude line of roughly 30 degrees above the equator. But when we start looking at the connection of other sites around the world, this is where it kind of gets a bit weird and a bit interesting. If you're into numbers, I know it's like the afternoon, you've just had a big lunch, etc. cetera, but uh, let's, let's plow through here. Because this is actually from Graham Hancock's book, Heaven's Mirror, I'm sure many of you have got it. Um, and he noticed as well that there's lots of these different number systems that can, when you look at Easter Island or you look at Namadol in the Pacific or Angkor Wat, there's specific degrees, because there's 360 degrees in the circle, there's specific numbers of degrees away from Giza, from the Giza Meridian. And they keep, the same numbers keep popping up or divisions of the same number, i.e. 72, 144, uh, 108. And these are all what he thought were, were processional numbers which are all related to the great cycles of precession of the equinoxes. But when you look at the, um, this, pen, this pentagon here, you can kind of see that they're also the internal angles of a pentagon. Um, and this really blew my mind. When me and John Martin, I started doing some research on this, and we realized that maybe it was a pentagonal system they were working with when they were designing and laying out the sites around the world. And this, again, would suggest some kind of knowledge of the Earth grid. Uh, because these are the faces of a dodecahedron as well. Um, and like, like for example, 144 degrees is two-fifths of a circle. 
Uh, 108 degrees is the internal angle. 72 degrees is one fifth of the planetary circumference, and so on and so on and so on. And these are just some other examples of some more random uh, connections from Giza to other sites. This is Quito, uh, which is the Inca capital in Ecuador which is 110 degrees west. It isn't a pentagonal number, but it's worth mentioning. 120 degrees west is Luban tomb, and also some other sites throughout the whole Mexico, Guatemala area, and Belize, uh, which is one third of the way around the planet. And here's just uh, an example of lots of different things we discovered and we put in the book. Uh, these are longitudes from Giza. So, you know, these aren't all pentagonal numbers, but they're worth showing here. Uh, some interesting ones here are Chavin, which is this massive megalithic complex up in Peru, which I visited a couple of years ago. It's really hard to get to, really scary, uh, but worth it. That's 108 degrees. Uh, Chichen Itza Kapani is a famous, obviously, pyramid sites, which have obvious connections to Giza. Easter Island's 140, and so on and so on. These ones are interesting, because these, this, we've just removed Giza from the kind of matrix here. And these are Easter Island and Kawat. If you draw a line between those going longitudinally, it's 144 degrees. Um, if we draw a line and Kawat to Kiribati, which is in the Pacific, that's 72 degrees. Paracas to Easter Island, 36 degrees, which is one tenth of a circle, and so on and so on and so on. Even the Bosnian pyramids get a throw in here. There's a quarter of a circle from Machu Picchu to the uh, Bosnian pyramids. So the list goes on. Um, and we're going to, you know, now you know how to do this yourself on Google Earth, you can come back to me with some more examples, please. That's your homework. This is just some more uh, sort of numbers and strange geometries and connections. This kind of intrigues me, uh, this one here. Um, so if we have the equator, if we divide this quadrant into sevenths, which is, you know, which is what the ancients, uh, we believe, used to do in some areas. Luxor is two-sevenths of the way up from the equ equator, and Avebury is four-sevenths up from the equator, uh, you know, as though this was ch chopped into sevenths. Uh, is that a coincidence? This is, I mean, this is kind of very strange uh, when you start looking at that. And sevens keep popping up when you look at the different geodesy uh, and numbers within the Avebury circle when you relate it to other sites. If you, if you divide three, 360 over 7, that equals the exact uh, GPS reading of where Avebury is on the planet. If you just divide that on a calculator, you get the exact GPS reading. Is that just a coincidence? Um, and this is how Stonehenge, Avebury, and the roll rights all fit within the 51 to 52 degree um, part of the, um, this part of the sort of surface of England. Also, Giza is like one... You can see here from the equator, 30 degrees up, and this is like one-sixth of the planetary circumference if you're going around it in a hoop. So coming back to this, the Avebury and Luxor thing, and the sevens that keep popping up, again, we notice here if you divide 360 over seven, you get the exact GPS latitude, longitude coordinate of Avebury if you do it on a calculator. It's just, it can't happen, but it does. And then John Martin came up with this when he, um, he came up with this bit of research. And he noticed that these corners kind of bugged him on Avebury for a while, because uh, they sh shouldn't be there. And he noticed that if you, the two stone circles that kind of used, well, one of them's still there, but um, if you take the center points of them and draw a line marking where these, where this, these corners are, and draw them on a map, you divide these angles, to, these angles again show the exact GPS location of Avebury where it is on the planet. So you keep finding all these strange anomalies, all these different sites. Um, again, this just shows you the great prime meridian, I believe that would extend all the way up to the North and South Pole, obviously. This is the great circle. This is just something I wanted to throw in here because this is something that a guy called Jim Allison discovered. Uh, a lot of people use it, they don't credit him for it, but he, he kind of discovered this. And this takes in like about 15 or 20 very powerful ancient sites around the planet. And it's believed it could have been the old equator even. For example, it takes in Nazca in Peru, Machu Picchu in Peru, to Sali in Africa, Siwa, Giza, Ur, Angkor Wat, Easter Island, and many others, all going in this great perfect circle. It's like it's cutting the earth in two. So I just wanted to sort of mention that, because I think this is very important. If any of you have seen the, the documentary Revelation of the Pyramids, anybody seen that? They talk about the same alignment. I do recommend you see that if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But they extend it much wider. It's like several, like 15, 20 miles wide. And then they put that all around the planet using the same alignment. And they bring in hundreds of other sites suddenly fit into this uh, particular alignment all around the planet. But he did a very thin line and still got all these results. So 
good credit here for Jim Allison. And Robin Heath, who's been a speaker here before, um, I've worked, this is something he came up with when he was working with the Lunation Triangle, this part here. I'm sure many of you have seen this picture before, you've probably seen Robin's talks. I highly recommend any of his books. He worked a lot with John Michel, John Martineau and others. But he came originally up with this Lunation Triangle, which is basically uh, an, a larger version of the four station stones that make an oblong or a rectangle within Stonehenge. When he expanded that, he realised that the corner point touches Lundy Island, where, funnily enough, me, him, and a bunch of lay hunters found a stone circle that was lost and buried for thousands of years, right at this point here. We went there back in 2008. And this is the Bluestone site where the stones from Stonehenge came from. And look, so when you, and suddenly you have this three, four, uh, this sort of 12, 13, oh, what is it, 5, 12, 13 triangle. And also he discovered this great three, four, five triangle. Well, these are Pythagorean triangles. These are, you know, Pythagoras wasn't even born then when these sites were being built. But this line here particularly interests me. Um, it's kind of really got my attention. And then I, I noticed that Robin Heath had actually mapped that out around the world. He'd extended it. I realised not only did it go through the Bluestone uh, Priscelli site, but when you go in this direction, it goes very close to Delphi, Giza, Mecca. It goes all the way around. It goes through the whole area of Newark, uh, and the Serpent Mound and others, and comes back through many of the megalithic sites in Ireland and back down to Priscelli and Stonehenge. So that kind of blew my mind when, uh, when that came forth. So again, was this a deliberate design? Was this part of the Great Survey? Was this just the English and Welsh part of the survey they were doing? And actually, it went much further. Now, Peter Knight, who I think is in here somewhere, uh, this is actually from his uh, book, uh, he's the Wessex Astrum. And this line here between Stonehenge and Broccoli is actually the exact same alignment as that. Uh, and, I, and so that kind of blew my mind when that I noticed the similarities there. It's actually the same alignment, it's the exact same angle. So suddenly all these different patterns going from local to national to international appear from Stonehenge and all these other sites. Uh, and we have to, you have to question, um, was this deliberate design? This is another fascinating example. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, put this out here as well. Um, this is the Great Apollo St. Michael Axis that was originally noted by Gene Riker when he discovered Delphi, Denona and Delos were all uh, one degree apart, north and south of each other in this whole, and these were all oracle kind of sites where magical um, events and happenings had taken place. And they would go there to receive direct wisdom from these sites, from the energies and the gods and goddesses of these sites. But when, he, when these were drawn to a line, John Michel did some work on this and realized there was a great alignment stretching all the way up to England and going through many St. Michael and Apollo sites, all the way up to uh, Mont St. Michel, St. Michael's Mount and Skellig Michael. Um, and so we see that there's more connections keep coming up. This is two and a half thousand miles long. And Hamish Miller and Paul Broadus even went and doused it. Uh, that took them about 10 years, I think. Um, but thank God they did. So they've some amazing research has come out of this. So these are just some classic examples of things that have already been discovered. I'm sure there's much more to come. These are just some examples of the geometries uh, that have been discovered up in Scotland and in other parts of Northern Europe, mainly Scotland. Um, and these just show clearly the five different platonic solids. And these go back at least 2000 BC, probably more, because they were found at some of the Aberdeenshire stone circles, which date to three or 4,000 BC. So they can't really be called platonic solids anymore because Plato wasn't even in existence then. Um, and so we know that they were working with these intricate geometries, these all hand-sized as well. Now, Keith Critchlow, master geometer, who wrote um, a number of amazing books um, about these different geometrical subjects, um, combined all these together, all the ones that have been discovered, and put them into this kind of one whole system. And he came up with this. Um, which kind of fascinated me because it's an exact copy of the Earth grid system. Um, so we have to kind of think, were these spheres used as part of that particular system? Um, which kind of always, um, always sort of stuns me. I'm just going to check the time a bit here. Yeah, OK. So now we're going to move on to some more esoteric kind of stuff. I just wanted to give you, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this image. This is, if any of you knew Robert Kuhn, you know he came up with this image. He was a Glastafarian for some years. Um, and he had this visionary idea that there were these great kind of dragon currents going all the way around the world. Uh, and this one actually is an extension of the St. Michael line. 
And it goes right through pretty much here. Um, and so it goes all the way through down through here, which we're going to have a look at shortly. It goes up to these other sites. And he was very into this idea that they were chakra points or chakra systems of the planet. And Glastonbury was the heart chakra of the planet, which I'm sure many of us agree that probably is the case. But there are different versions of different chakras and people have other ideas. So it all gets a bit confusing, but I'm sticking with this one. Um, but it's these lines that kind of get me because these are like great hoops that go around the world. These are like great circles of energy. And, and each of these lines has, has a male and female part, like, like a caduceus weaving around each other. Like this, like this Michael and Mary lines weave around the Michael axis. Uh, and I've been to a few of these places here. This, this whole area here is where I've studied the most. Uh, I've actually been down there, I've doused it, and I've done some tests, uh, and I'm sure they're there. I'd love it if anyone could go there and either back up my, um, back this up, or prove it wrong, I don't mind. Um, these, just, these are the chakra points, uh, just if anyone's interested in that. This is the graphic that uh, Tor Webster now uses, he's created the Rainbow Serpent Project, he's created a couple of excellent videos about it, and he's travelled to all these sites. Uh, and he's really sort of holding the torch of that and keeping that alive and sort of manifesting magic at all these different sacred sites. This is the English um, aspect of it, which is the famous Michael and Mary currents. We all know about these, I'm sure. Um, and this is obviously the whole Glastonbury area kind of down here. Uh, the West Country, all the way down from Cornwall, all the way up to this area here, which is where I'm kind of from, Wandleberry. And I'm actually writing a book about Wandleberry at the moment because that is an absolutely fascinating site in itself. And there's evidence that that was part of a larger geodetic system stretching across England and possibly across the world. But anyway, back to, this is the area in South America uh, where we, um, let me just show you this. The, the one too far. So this is the area here. This is, the, this is one of my favourite areas on the planet, really. Uh, this whole area around Lake Titicaca. Uh, and also here, I've done a lot of travelling in this particular area. And um, when I went over there, I couldn't quite believe um, how many, you know, how hard it was to get over to this island for st to start with. But also, when, when you go on Google Earth, and you extend the Michael axis all the way around the planet, it goes exactly through the centre of the Island of the Sun on Lake Titicaca which kind of um, really inspired me when I got there. And then I went up to the northern part of the island first and found this particular strange megalithic site here, just on the northern part. It's like a dolmen. Uh, this is a huge rock underneath it as well. These square chunks. It's almost like it was a ceremonial table. Some people say it was a sacrificial table, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, but this whole area of the island is where Viracocha, or the plumed serpent, um, who was the great god of the Andes, of Peru and Bolivia, was said to have emerged from the lake on a raft of serpents and actually created the great uh, Viracochan Empire, which was way before the Inca, thousands of years before the Inca. And he was a fair-skinned, bearded god with a band of travellers with him. And they taught all the arts and sciences and almost like, it's almost like um, they were kind of like culture bearers. And... This is the area here on the island of the Sun of Lake Titicaca where he was supposed to have arisen from the lake. Down here is the area of where, this is where the Mary energy current, I'm probably called something else in South America. This is where the Michael energy current is. This is the main axis. This one here, this dark blue line, is the other great serpent that we saw on the main map, which we'll have a look at shortly. Um, Again, this is the path of where the energy line goes. It goes through this, and it goes through this kind of effigy. And some people believe this is some kind of dragon or serpent effigy. Some people, I believe it looks more like a frog, to be honest with you. Um, and there's different theories about that, about who that, about exactly what it is. But it's under here. There's a whole area where lots of offerings have been made, and seeds are placed there, and uh, people come over, and they, you know, come over from the mainland, and they do ceremony and things like this. And this is the spot where the two great global currents cross, exactly there at this point, uh, which I thought was rather interesting. And this is just uh, another thing we're going to be researching when we go back there uh, this November. We're going to be doing a bit of another tour, another research trip, in that whole area. We're going to go to the Island of the Sun and look at all these sites. We're going to have dowsing rods and see if we can locate the energies ourselves. This is... This, is, this area here is all around that area we've just been looking at. This is the great path of Viracocha. 
Now, this it was said that when he emerged from Lake Titicaca, he actually travelled in a certain direction, headed northwest. Uh, up to the coast and built all the megalithic sites like Machu Picchu, uh, obviously Tiwanaku further south, you know, the, the, the remains on the island of the sun, Oyente Tambo, going all the way up to Chavin and Chan Chan and other sites before he disappeared and left. And he created all these megalithic sites, these ancient sites. He taught all the arts and sciences. He was able to summon thunder and levitate stones. He was like a great wizard magician of the Andes. And he looks like a classic... Merlin type wizard. He was very he was very tall, had pale skin, blue eyes, and he was called a shining one as well. He was like sort of bright, you know, way about him. So this really interests me because you find these examples all the way around the world. And this is something that absolutely fascinates me. And uh, you get the same thing going up into Mexico. And uh, we'll have a look at um, the Mexican stuff just in a moment. This is Tiwanaku as it used to look when it was first discovered. Uh, and you can see it's like a great big stone circle, well, actually a stone rectangle. And it had rough hewn megaliths, just like we get in England, very similar to Stonehenge. Uh, and this is a picture of the, the staff wielding God Viracocha, where he would hold two staffs, much like we see at the Long Man of Wilmington uh, and many other places. So it's an absolutely fascinating site. And uh, we are going there this year um, with David Hatcher Childress and Brian Forrest and Glenn Broughton, I'm sure some of you know. And we're going to be exploring all these sites with a focus on this particular path of Viracocha and the earth energies and other things. And uh, you can find out more of the flyers we've got outside. And you can see this here, where this great serpent goes. This is the, the male great serpent, according to Robert Kuhn. This is, it virtually follows the same alignment as the path of Viracocha. So I really question, was Viracocha a global traveler? teaching all these different arts and sciences. Uh, because we have the same legends of Quetzalcoatl up here. We have very similar legends in England and Ireland, even in Egypt and other places, with all these references to these great gods of antiquity who just arrived, did some amazing stuff there, and then they left. Uh, and uh, it keeps, you, the more you look, the more you find that this is the case. This is where the, the, the energy line moves through Mexico. I went up to this area, Back in 2010, spent a few months exploring uh, the whole kind of Olmec area, which kind of really fascinated me. And this particular, it goes through Palenque, which is obviously the famous site where Lord Votan uh, was discovered and they built, he's got the famous um, the Pakal's tomb and his lid. He was a giant, he was like eight or nine feet tall apparently. Um, and he, some people say he was a fair skinned bearded guy, again, linking in with these kind of gods who traveled the world. Tortuguero as well, which is famous, you may have seen Jeff Stray talking about this, it's one of the only inscriptions showed the 2012 date and coast cocos which means serpent sanctuary which is actually where he was supposed to have arrived and left from um, on, again on a raft of serpents and with the same description and the same stories as you get in south america uh, this just shows you uh this is actually la, la venta this is one of the most important um olmec sites and you can see these great basalt uh, megalithic heads uh, almost Egyptian looking or even African looking. There's also carvings with clearly Caucasian people with beards and headdresses and things like this. Now, there's a lot more going on than just this. I, I think for the next chapter of this talk, I really want to go into, I'm not sure exactly how long I've got left, but I want to go into the connections worldwide, just a summary of what's been going on around the world. There's lots and lots of strange anomalies. On my, I travel quite widely. I spent a lot of time exploring North America, Central and South America, Egypt, um, Europe, and um, you know, Easter Island, other places, as far and wide as I can possibly go. Um, and I keep finding so many anomalies and similarities in different aspects of these cultures. The polygonal walls is a particularly interesting one. Uh, the elongated skulls, these seem to be coming up everywhere now. The geometry within the landscape of the sites, they're all using the same system of geometry and maths. The giant legends, now these aren't really legends anymore because I'm working on a project now on a, on a video and a book with some researchers in America that clearly there, there, there was a giant race that lived in America and all around the world, which I've got, there's lots of evidence. This is one example here that was actually sold to the Smithsonian about 150 years ago. And also the layout of sites, which is linked with the geometry. And this here, we'll have a look at in a moment. But I mean, I think one of the most interesting examples when we look at the global connections is these strange walls. 
Because if you ask any stonemason uh, to go and do this, they just they wouldn't do it, or they want over a million pounds to do it. Because it's one of the most difficult and tricky ways of making a wall. <laughs> it's almost impossible. Um, they're, all, they're all irregular. None of them, there's no order to it whatsoever. Every single stone is different. There's hundreds of these walls all over Sachiwaman, uh, Cusco, all over different parts of South America, not just in Peru. Uh, even at Angkor Wat, you have the same kind of construction when they were building some of the great Buddhist heads and bodies and the, and the, the temple there. Even on, this is actually the pyramid, the small pyramid in Giza plateau. This, this, wasn't, this isn't just a white-faced limestone flat wall with regular blocks. These were polygonal pieces of granite transported 600 miles from Aswan. Um, and look at this. It's just, these are all irregularly shaped. Some of them puff out like you get in Cusco. Uh, it's just an incredible engineering feat. These just show you some other ones. This is in Osaka, Japan. This is one of the great uh, temples there. Um, this is in Saudi Arabia. This is one of the great tombs, and they get, you get these strange little carvings, which are very similar to stuff you find in Peru, Bolivia, and in Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. This is in Greece. You have these great cyclopean polygonal walls. This is in Italy. I visited here a few years ago. Uh, I thought that was quite a fun uh, little thing to discover. And this is thanks to, you know, it's thanks to Gary Biltcliffe um, that he kind of inspired me to go out there and have a good look around Italy, because all over Italy, all along the western coast, north and south of Rome, uh, just megalithic walls going up at 30, 40 feet in the air. Cyclopean walls that just, you cannot explain it. It just doesn't, it's almost impossible to consider how they could have done that. Uh, this is actually in Turkey. This is a place called Alaka Huyak. Uh, this is Hattusa nearby. Uh, again, we see the massive polygonal blocks, all in different parts of the world. Um, and so the more you look and the more you actually visit these sites, you, fi you find the similarities. Um, you really have to get out there if you really want to find out for yourself what was really going on. Again, we're doing another trip out there in September to Gebekli Tepe and to these poly some of these polygonal sites with Graham Hancock and Andrew Collins. Um, you're welcome to join us, pretty much full to be honest with you. Um, but this just shows you the uh, examples around the world. Even Easter Island, there's a site in Easter Island that the great Moai went on, on top of. So how did, they, how did this get shared around the world like that? Egypt, different, asp different parts, this is even in Luxor, uh, the Sphinx Temple, uh, obviously in South America, and Sache Woman. Okay. Now this is where it gets a little weird. Um, this was discovered in Pennsylvania with a seven-foot skeleton. This was discovered in Wisconsin, uh, all the sort of mid-eastern mid areas of North America. Now, this is for real. <laughs> this isn't like, you know, someone's mask or anything. This is a skull of a seven-foot beast. Um, and this, and it's not really known so much in North America. It's more known in Peru and Bolivia which are these skulls here. This is something we kind of really, we make a big effort to visit these when we go there on our tours, our trips. Because Brian Forrester is like one of the world's leading experts on this and he, got, and he actually owns, or half part owns a museum which actually collects them. Like they're still scattered in graveyards all over the, the west coast of Peru. He goes there and he collects them up and puts them in his museum. Uh, some of them are huge, they're ridiculously big. I mean, uh, imagine if my head was up there, well, you'd, you'd, I'm sure you'd have a giggle. Um, but this is not just in Peru, but that's where the most of them are found. This, they're all around the world. Uh, this is different at parts of Peru and Bolivia. Uh, this is uh, an effigy from Sumeria. You get these strange skulls here which have puffed out either side. This is a very long one. Uh, and you can just see, you know, diff even in Egypt, in Malta, they found like what they called the, the loaf skulls, and they look more like loaves of bread going way back. So it, it seems like there was a different race of human on Earth a few thousand years ago, and this has been heavily suppressed. And, and the more, the way you find these megalithic sites, you often find the skulls. Uh, so this is kind of something that's been fascinating. And also in Mexico, as well, it isn't on here, there's several sites in the Olmec area of Mexico, and up in Sonora, which is almost up at the North American border. In Sonora, they've actually found an area where not only did they find the long skulls like these, they found giant skeletons as well, going up to eight or nine feet tall. And also, when you look at cer certain places around the world, we find the people who may have built them were this tall. These giant legends we hear about 
all around the world aren't just legends, and I really must emphasize that. I've been doing some quite deep research on this, working with a guy called Jim Vieira and Ross Hamilton, who are based in New England and Ohio, respectively. And uh, Ross has written a couple or three books about the giants that have been discovered in the mounds, like in Newark and other places, Serpent Mound, others, where they range from between seven feet and 14 feet tall. And this has been completely suppressed by the American um, sort of cultural and the government and things like that. And they all get sent off to the Smithsonian Institution and they disappear. Um, there's many have been found in the southwest region, the Four Corners area. There's a, whole, there's a whole load of research on that. In California, there's a place called Lompoc Ranch, which I went to visit a few years ago to try and find um, evidence of a 12-foot skeleton that was found there that had double rows of teeth. Uh, I went there and it was now a military zone and you couldn't go in there. Um, and so we know there's a lot of uh, stories going. This was actually bought by the Smithsonian for $500 and I've seen a copy of the receipts. Uh, so the Smithsonian deny they even exist, but there's hundreds of uh, reports of them actually buying them up. It's just no, another quick example. I just I think this is really interesting because it's not just North America. We look at there's been there's been large skulls and skeletons found near Stonehenge. There's been huge axe axe heads and hammers found in some caves in North Wales, which only a nine or ten foot person could yield. Uh, there's been other skeletons found in Scotland and reports going way, way back. And it's all been kind of pretty much covered up in France, Turkey, China, all around the world. This is just one from New York. This was the guy who actually found some uh, skeletons in some mounds in western New York state. And he decided to reconstruct how tall they would be. And this is over nine feet tall. And so, you know, we have to kind of question what was going on. Even in Ireland, um, there's the famous Irish giant that was discovered, like a mummified giant, which was 12 foot tall, which wasn't a fake, they don't think now. And this is the book we're working on and the video we're working on at the moment. Uh, you can see similarities. This is obviously uh, Menantol in Cornwall and even in New Hampshire, North America, New England, we find very similar. Never been able to find this. I've been up there and I've not been able to find it. We have dolmens in countries they shouldn't be. This is in New York State, just 50, 60 miles north of New York. This huge megalithic dolmen, um, which has no explanation. And this just shows you examples of the connections around the world, from Wales to France, to Tunisia to Jordan. But even in North Korea, uh, all over Korea and the Middle East, even in Australia, they found dolmens, uh, Canada, South America, the list goes on. We can't help but notice there are these connections worldwide. This is one of the sites we visited, a place called Portsmouth Earthworks in Ohio. And the thing that fascinated me about these, not only are these extremely huge, but they've also been pretty much destroyed now, but luckily they were mapped by Squire and Davis. You look at this, yeah? Does that resemble Avebury at all? Um, Little things like this, and even the avenue coming down here, which was uh, earthworks, here they're stones, go to this sort of earthwork kind of circle here, and the sanctuary there. And another alignment going down here, which goes into like nothing. And this actually crosses a really fast moving river, <laughs> they somehow managed to do that. So whether there was a bridge there, and these kind of, the only thing left really are these two uh, horseshoe mounds here, which we actually hung out with. Uh, and when we went there to check it out, there's just a bunch of drunks and kids playing on the swings, um, which is fun. So, um, so this just shows you some examples of some the connections worldwide, not only the grids and the, the sort of mathematics and the geometry they were using, but also the way that they use the same technologies, the same kind of mindset all around the world. And I hope this has given you some food for thought. I've got a bunch of DVDs and a couple of books if you want, or you can come and talk to me if you want to get more information about this, or you can join us on um, some of our tours. So thanks very much for listening. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, Hugh Newman. Thank you, Hugh. Sure.